Welcome to the Open EdX Podcast. This is John Mark Walker, your host, and we are here today with Candice Till. Candice is the Director of Learning Science and Engineering at Amazon and will be delivering a keynote on March 27th at the upcoming Open edX conference held by the University of California, San Diego from March 26th to March 29th. Hi, Candice. How are you? It's great to have you today. I'm very well, John. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, and for the, uh, for the sake of our listeners, could you please introduce yourself and what you do? Certainly. Um, so I currently have two things that I do. I am I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education um, at Stanford University, and I'm also on leave currently from Stanford, serving as the Director of Learning Science and Engineering at Amazon Incorporated in Seattle. Interesting. So from academia to uh, to uh, corporate life, it must be uh, quite the transition. It's actually not as big a transition as you would think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I'm really uh, pleased to have you here. Uh, you have quite the stellar uh, history and reputation in the world of kind of online learning and digital learning. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, kind of go back through time a little bit and kind of set the stage for where you are now. If you could maybe uh, give us a little background and um, you know how you've gotten to this point. Sure, happy to. So I, I started working in this area at Carnegie Mellon uh, back in 2002, where I started a pro was the founding director of the Open Learning Initiative, and the Open Learning Initiative way predated MOOCs, but the idea was kind of similar. How could we give um, access, open access? to a high quality post-secondary education to those who otherwise wouldn't have the privilege of sitting in institutions like Carnegie Mellon or like MIT or like Stanford or like Santa Ana Community College. Um, and at the time though, uh, that was, as I said, way before MOOCs, uh, what we attempted to do was create open web-based learning environments that were grounded in what our current understanding was of human learning and designed to both support learners, but also using those environments as research environments to collect the learner's interaction data, um, to use it to both refine our understanding of human learning, but also to refine the environments that we were creating for learners. That's fascinating. So there was actually kind of a twofold purpose there. One was to to actually give people uh, education online, but also to learn how people were learning and use it for research purposes. Exactly. In fact, the first, uh, uh, when the open learning, when we started the open learning initiative, uh, the first purpose was, was to give access to open learning. It was funded by um, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation originally, and they had been, um, uh, going around the, they had just funded MIT's open courseware. And so they were going around the country to other, um, you know, research universities asking people to, um, to do open courseware. And uh, of course, Carnegie Mellon, um, I don't know if I should say this, was <laughs> going to do a derivative work of something MIT was doing. That just wasn't going to happen. Of course. Yes. Um, and, so, and Carnegie Mellon, as you know, had a long history of intelligent tutoring oh. systems. And so um, originally when, when uh, Mike Smith and Kathy Casserly came from the Hewlett Foundation, uh, Carnegie Mellon was ready to pitch a completely different project. And uh, Mike and Kathy were pretty interested in the open courseware idea. So they said, no, thanks. And we're going to leave. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, as luck or if you want to call it luck would have it, the day that Mike and Kathy were visiting Carnegie Mellon was September 11th. <gasps> okay. And so they ended up spending three days um, in Pittsburgh that they hadn't planned on spending. And so while they were grounded, while everyone was grounded in Pittsburgh, everyone was grounded during that time, uh, spent the time really talking through what were the real goals of open courseware? And if the real goal was to create a high quality, give access to a high quality post-secondary education to those who didn't have access, then Carnegie Mellon's perspective or our perspective was it was more than just putting the course material that supports a high quality course online, but rather you had to figure out a way to enact instruction online. And so the proposal was to bring the expertise that Carnegie Mellon had 
in intelligent tutoring system in cognitive science and blend that with the subject matter experts to design open web-based learning environments that could support learning. That's interesting. I, I can only imagine how terrifying this concept must have been to you know certain people that you were working with. Um, it, uh, well, you know, it's interesting. It wasn't, I don't know that it was terrifying. It was, um, it was intriguing. Okay. Um, and, and when the, when the Hewlett Foundation did decide, so they decided to fund, uh, four courses for us to do four courses and, uh, which was, you know, as you know, uh, open courseware was, had, had committed to do or, and actually did put the material from all of MIT's courses online. So four courses was quite was a small number, but it, but we were taking a very different approach. Um, and so then um, what I did was went around, when we got the funding, I went around to the different uh, departments at Carnegie Mellon and said, we have this funding to do this cool thing. Who wants to uh, create courses? And um, the interesting thing there was the, and maybe this is what you're referring to, that the, um, the faculty and the departments we're all very excited and willing to participate in this project of creating these open web-based learning environments for people who did not have the privilege right. of coming to Carnegie Mellon. But, but everyone was very clear that the idea was for people out there and that these courses were not going to be used to uh, change anything about how teaching and learning was done at Carnegie Mellon. Interesting. And with those assurances, uh, we started. Right. And it was a uh, so so. Uh, anyway, you just asked about the history of how I got here. So I did that, and then we can talk more about OLI because I do think uh, Open Learning Initiative, which we call OLI, because I do think what happened there is is actually really interesting. It is. But fast forward into uh, two thousand and. Uh, uh, 13, where I was recruited from Carnegie Mellon to Stanford. Um, and you might remember, this was kind of like right during the 2012-2013, the right during the MOOC hype. Yes. And I was a pretty vocal critic of MOOCs. Why uh, is that? <laughs> pardon? Why is that? I was a vocal critic of MOOCs because, well, I, uh, so I celebrated the goal of MOOCs, because it was the same goal. It was how do we give right. uh, access to a high quality education to the massive number of people around the world who do not have the privilege of having access to that. Right. So I completely support and celebrate the shared goal with MOOCs. The thing that disappointed me or why I was such a critic was, um, one of the things that we know from decades of learning research is if you're trying to really support learning, the most effective way of doing that is not simply to record someone talking and make that available. So this idea of conflating, um, offering a lecture, um, a lecture online as equal to offering a high quality post-secondary educational experience. That was the part that I was really critical about. Got it. We were gonna put a lot of investment into um, scaling and making accessible education. Let's, let's start with what we know about human learning and see if we can design and, and the affordances of the technology and see if we can design these environments both to truly give access to the best of our ability, to an instructional experience that that has a high probability of leading to learning, but also to do the other piece, which is, um, you know, uh, to to learn more about human learning. You know, most people's experiences with MOOCs are pretty much what you said. They 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 go into a course, they see the talking head uh, giving a lecture. It's essentially, you know, I guess what you call a flipped class where. Uh, you know, it's just like you're sitting there in the lecture hall, except now you're receiving the video uh, content online. In your kind of ideal world, what should the experience be? Like, what 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 is missing uh, in that in that element? Uh, well, um, okay. So I'll just give you. Sorry. <laughs> um, think about something that uh, you, that you have, uh, especially something that's cognitively complex that you have learned 
um, recently. Because um, most of these courses or most of the experiences we're trying to give are for higher education content. So, sure. so mostly cognitively complex content. So if you're thinking about a capability or a skill or something that you've tried to develop that was cognitively complex, um, when you sat there and someone said to you, uh, John Mark, this is, this is it, and I'm going to tell you it for 45 minutes, Right. Um, then if you went and attempted to um, apply it, how much of it did you really get? <laughs> right. So what, what we kind of know is that where that we know a couple things. One of them is that any new knowledge that you're developing um, is uh, has to be integrated into whatever the conceptual structure is of your prior knowledge. So your prior knowledge will either support or inhibit your development of the new knowledge you're trying to develop. So if we don't have any idea about what your existing knowledge structure is, it's hard to know what the hooks are to support you to extend that or, or synthesize the new information into that. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we know is when you're when you're attempting to build um, new knowledge, con concept, concept, uh, uh, complex concepts, that um, one of the surprising findings out of learning research is it's actually better to um, not just give you a uh, you know our typical process is I'll explain it to you, I'll show you an example, then I'll let you try it. Right. Um, and actually, for some kinds of knowledge, that works great. Sure. For other kinds of knowledge, it's actually better to give you um, a, a couple or more contrasting cases that illustrate the deep structure of the concept I'm trying to get you to understand and have you struggle through trying to, from those contrasting cases, extract what the deep structure is before I even give you that principle. Uh, and uh, and so there's there it, that's just one small example. There's there's lots that we have learned or believe we understand about human learning over the over the decades in which learning research has been occurring, and to and for academics to not incorporate the current research of what we know about human learning into the design of learning environments that we're trying to scale. I just thought that was um, irresponsible. Frankly. Interesting. So, so you went to Stanford, and I presume that you were there to to kind of engage at this level to make a learning environment, as you saw, that was actually uh, geared towards uh, uh, enhancing the learning experience. Yes, and and the other reason for going to Stanford was, um, you know, Carnegie Mellon has a, and my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon have a deep expertise and bench strength on cognitive science and on intelligent tutoring systems and an information processing AI model for um, learning design. And that is very powerful. But what I learned was while that is very powerful and necessary, it's not sufficient because there are other factors uh, that exist in the learning experience that also have to be considered when one is attempting to design learning environments for sort of the masses. And those, and part of what drew me to Stanford was the researchers there, like uh, Claude Steele, who uh, researches you know, concepts around identity threat and stereotype threat, or Carol Dweck and her research in mindset, um, or Jeff Cohen and his research in social belonging, or Greg Walton also working in mindset and social belonging and identity dimensions. So what we do know, what their research has shown us is the interaction between the individual and the individual's identity and the context in which the learning is occurring or in which the knowledge will be applied are also incredibly important factors to consider when you're thinking about differentiating instruction. That is fascinating because, I mean, you were at Stanford, which is the heart of Silicon Valley. And, you know, as I'm sure you've discovered, uh, in Silicon Valley, apparently AI can solve everything. Um, so, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so I, I, I'm fascinated by what you were saying there and kind of juxtaposing that with the message that comes out of a lot of ed tech startups, for example, that are, uh, you know, in the valley. 
Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you know what I just said isn't actually in any way um, against that AI or machine learning has a role sure. in emerging educational technologies. Sure. In fact, I think that it is the emerging technologies and the capacity that AI um, and the new, especially the deep learning algorithms afford us that will enable us to actually make traction on how do we differentiate instruction for large numbers of people. So personal, personalized learning, for example. Yeah, and, and the reason, so so here's, here's a sort of Candace's framework for what we need to understand from our science before we can actually make guided principles for differentiating instruction. Um, I think, and and the, the, this is this is uh, where I'm doing my work. Is that there are features about the learner that are material for for deciding or, or making a decision about um, how best support that learner to learn something at this point in time. There are features about the knowledge or about the capability that you're hoping the person will learn that are material to making that decision. And then there are features about the context in which the learning is occurring or in which the knowledge or capability that is being developed will be applied that are material for making differentiated instructional decisions. And what's even really interesting is the interaction among those different features. So, um, so that's a lot of dimensions sure. to try and manage to be able to support a principled instructional differentiation decision. And it's actually way too many dimensions for our human brains. I was about to say that there has to be a machine learning component okay. to be able to yes. start to yes. make progress there. Yes. And so one of the areas that I am fascinated about that I, you know, engage with, you know, my other colleagues at Stanford that I also collaborate with are those in the uh, School of Engineering and Computer Science. Um, in fact, um, the Lytics Lab, which is um, the my research lab, um, I co-direct with John Mitchell, who is the um, now the chair of uh, computer science at Stanford. So there, and our students um, are real are you know we, we have students in our lab that come from education, from psychology, from economics, from communications, from computer science, um, that are all interested in this opportunity to um, understand human learning and design effective learning. Um, environments and analytic systems, but in any case, so so the, the the there is there is real value in using the power of machine learning sure. to to support our human judgment and human decision making. And I think it's a fascinating question to look at um, where are the appropriate interfaces and where are the appropriate roles for the humans in the system and for the machines in the system to be supporting decision-making. That is fascinating. Um, and I, I, as, I'm, as you've noticed uh, over the past couple of years, uh, companies have been becoming more and more interested in the whole science of learning and how they can apply it to their relationships, relationships with employees, with customers, with communities. And, you know, since, you know, you've taken leave from Stanford and you're now at Amazon, I can only imagine that you are, uh, you've seen this uh, phenomenon front and center. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the work I'm doing at Amazon is um, not, not so very different from the work that I was doing at Carnegie Mellon and at Stanford. Um, I am, as you said at the beginning, I'm the director of learning science and engineering at Amazon. And my role here is to lead uh, the global um, learning and development team to innovate and scale workplace learning for Amazon. So it is turning the, um, the attention um, away from uh, not-for-profit higher education, where I've been spending the last, what would that be, 15 years focused on learning in that space, to how do we um, innovate and scale based on what we know about human learning um, internal to Amazon, all of the people 
who work at Amazon. What, what's driving this investment? I mean, why, why does a company like Amazon, and, and it happens, it's not just Amazon. I mean, there are a ton of companies that are implementing programs like this. But what's driving their, uh, their activity here? Oh, um, well, if, if you have a large company and that is continuously innovating on behalf of its customers, and you have a commitment to continuously do that, then the skill sets and the knowledge of the people that are doing that innovation need to also be continuously increasing and improving. So your speed of innovation is, you know, one of the potential limiting factors to your speed of innovation is any limits on the capacity of your workforce to engage in that innovation. And there is and you know knowledge and skills and you know is is rapid what's needed is rapidly increasing and i think amazon and i would say pretty much almost any company that's really focused on continuous innovation can't really um feed its talent pipeline fast enough um so so if you have really and still internally there are you know different skills are needed at different points in time so if you if you have a really great employee um who is um who's who is just missing a particular skill set to be able to be a great employee in some other area in the company then it's it, it makes just way more business sense to invest to find ways of um, scaling and that skill building internal rather than, you know, the old model that people used to have, which is, oh, well, we just have to go hire. We just let those people go and hire some new people. <laughs> right. Um, do, do you think that the, you know, the, um, I guess the, the center of innovation for, or the center of, uh, the center of learning about learning, do you feel it's shifting more into the commercial direction or do you think universities will always kind of have, uh, the pole position in this area. You know, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I know what I, what I think it should be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, I think you know, fundamentally, um, building knowledge, creating new knowledge, and building knowledge and um, uh, and capability broadly for the human population of the world. That is, um, you know, creating and disseminating knowledge. That is higher education's mission, right. you know, writ large, and and higher education. And this is what I was saying for you know years uh, before I came to Amazon is information technology and the affordances of these machine learning algorithms and the technology are going to fundamentally change how we do teaching and learning, and I think actually for the better. Um, but uh, and my uh, my request, or I some would say my soapbox, or my <laughs> pounding on not-for-profit higher education was: this is our business. Right. We should be out. We have the re We have the capability. We have the expertise. We have the mission. We have everything we need to drive this and be out in front of this. And and I still think not-for-profit higher education has to be out in front of this. I think that is very, very well said. Uh, I, I am I am in awe of your uh, uh, research and uh, everything that you've been able to do. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming by. It's been a real pleasure and I think uh, a lot of listeners are gonna be uh, very engaged with this podcast. Thank you. Great, thanks. It was really fun, John Mark. Once again, you can see Candace Till at the upcoming Open edX conference hosted by the University of California, San Diego from March 26th to 29th. To get more details, go to conconopenedx.org, con.openedx.org.